All right, what's a trope I could talk about this week? I've gone over the early route discoveries, easing the player in, gone over rock monsters. Ah, I could talk about the pseudo legendary, but mm, maybe another day. You know what? Today we'll be talking about object mons before I show you more of my own designs. A common complaint when it comes to creature collectors like Pokemon is that some of the designs look too artificial to be alive. Heck, let's just talk about Pokemon for a bit. I remember that around Generation 4, this complaint about object mons started to murmur in the playground. And why is that? Well, I should make a separate video on what makes a Pokemon a Pokemon one day, but a part of that discussion is that Pokemons are creatures. Is the potion bottle a Pokemon? No cheating. I'm not telling you to give it eyes or any limbs. Does the bottle alone look like a Pokemon? No. Despite the Pokemon's expanding roster, the bottle itself doesn't look like a legitimate entry for a dex. Even if later on there's a Mon designed after this bottle, this bottle alone just looks like a non-living bottle. Now, if you give it some eyes and a semblance of sentience, well, yeah, it could maybe pass as an object Mon. So are object Mons this evil sin that should never be in the decks? No, I mean, object Mons are perfectly fine. Even in the first generation, you got mons like Magnemite and Voltorb, and no one gives a big deal about those mons. Heck, in Generation 3, there were a ton of abstract amorphous object mons. But I think this discussion started once we've had more direct references to the objects. They're not fuzzy beans that happen to look like an object, but rather just a straight up object with eyes. A lot of times, this leads to object mons being ghost, psychic, or fairy type, as this mysticism powers up or possesses the object, which often is a steel object. Hmm, maybe it has to do with how metal's a good conductor? Maybe it's because some metals can react to magnetic fields? But that's just a theory, a north theory. Over time, many have come to accept these objects as legit creatures of their own. Honestly, I haven't heard anyone complain about the object mons in recent generations. Maybe they just have other things to complain about. So how should you go about making object-based creatures? Well, you should do whatever you want. There's no rubric on what you could do or not. And everyone has their own tendencies anyways. So how would I go about making object-based creatures? Well, thank you for asking. For context, I'm making my own creature collector based off of science topics. Now, I've been looking at my designs to see if there's any object mods I could talk about today, but most of them have already been featured in previous videos. So let me go over them quickly. Bunge here references the Bunsen burner, which is a controlled flame you could use in a lab to heat things up. And despite looking like a burner, Bunge is also a sponge that you can see in the ocean floor. All right, let's see. There's also Pipish, which is a pipette, which you use to transfer specific amounts of fluids and... Hey, that's not an object bond. That, that's a fish. What's that doing here? And that's the thing. While writing the script for this video, I found out that I usually try to pair an animalistic body plan to the concept I'm working on, even if the concept by itself is an object. Honestly, the only true object mod I would say that I have is the security cameras about photons, which I covered in my previous video. They look like cameras and not really any specific living thing. But I think I could still share one more line that I would call mostly an object mod. Thank you for coming to my failing stand-up career, and here's a joke. How did he get across the road? Well, there's a few ways. Let's start with radiation. Radiation earned themselves a scary name over the years, but we're talking about heat here. Radiation means that energy is sent through electromagnetic waves or as other quantum particles when we're talking about radioactive materials. But an example of radiation in heat would be sunlight which is radiation from the sun to the earth, warming that planet up. Anything that's hot radiates heat around it, allowing you to feel it without you actually touching it. So tuna rad here is a hot coil giving off heat. Now, while touching the hot coil should be hot, that's another kind of heat transfer, not exactly the point of radiation. So tuna rad is a pyro ghost type, 
they're just a source of heat that's weirdly hard to touch. So instead of letting you touch it and burn yourself, they could pass through obstacles, illuminate, and also call for harsh sunlight. Now hold on to your seat, because these abilities are going to change a lot. So Tuna Rat can possess certain objects by heating them up, using that radiation to offer a different kind of heat transfer. If they heat up a heavy cast iron skillet, well, now you have an object you want to avoid touching. When heat transfers due to contact, that is called conduction. Yes, touching a hot coil would burn you too, but to illustrate the point of radiation, Tuna Rat was a ghost you couldn't touch, but now, as a cast iron pan, you need to be a lot more careful to avoid touching Tuna Duct. There's that flame body into play. I'm using Pokemon lingo for the abilities, but I'll have my own names whenever I do make my own project in the distant future. Tuna Duck also has Flash Fire, so that incoming fire attacks only powers them up. There's one more method of heat transfer I want to represent, which means that Tuna Rad has a branched evolution between conduction and convection. Convection is the transfer of heat through fluids, because when fluids like liquids and gases get heated, they become less dense and rise, transferring the heat from down below to up top, where that fluid may cool off and come back down, making this swirling pattern in the fluid. This is how weather patterns work, and that's how storms can be calculated to predict where they might go next. Now, this branched evolution of Tuna Rad heating up a filled kettle instead would lead to, expectedly, Tuna Vet. But what are these mods anyways? While they're mostly object mods and designs, there were initially sea squirts or tuna kits, which are animals, but this whole line kind of started with tuna vec being a sea squirt kettle. Now, tuna duct doesn't look like a sea squirt at all, but I got attached to the design and named the line after tuna kits regardless, as the subphylum comes in all sorts of shapes, anyways. With all that said, allow me to show you the pyro hydro type of my project. Tuna Vet. They got white smoke because of water vapor coming out of the kettle, and they got water absorbed because more water can just add to the convection inside them. And as tuna kits, both Tuna Vect and Tuna Duck got filter as an ability. Object mods are perfectly fine as they can offer some diversity in your roster. Honestly, I plan on making some more in the future, as I have a few in mind already. But hey, we took this opportunity to go over some basic modes of heat transfer. So I hope you learned something today, even if my stand-up career is no longer. Either way, if you like what you saw, follow along as I'm making more videos to go through the mons of my STEM-based creature collector. I want to thank my Patreon subscribers due to their direct support, some of the higher tiers would have access to work in progress shots and other notes about my project, but you can always like and share this video for free. That'll be it for today, so thank you for watching till the end, and I'll see you next time.